And at some point, you know, the supernova lights up for us. Hey, whoa, supernova. So every antenna, every telescope in the world is aimed at that supernova. And, you know, 12 hours, 15 hours, 20 hours, whatever a half day is for the aliens. Later, after we start studying it, we get this message. It says, hi, where are the Klingons? <laughs> you know, want to come to our parties. Okay, so this, this is pretty nifty because it tells, you, it tells you when to look and where. You don't have to, you know, just have long, long lists of star systems to look at. You just look at a supernova whenever it goes off. Okay. The trouble is, of course, there aren't that many supernovae going off in our galaxy. And in other galaxies, it's a little unclear whether it's big enough to get anybody interested. But this is a clever idea. I think it's a very clever idea. Here's another idea. I, f- I floated this idea years ago at a conference in Italy where it got essentially no notice. And since then, it's been ignored. But here it is. It turns out that on the basis of theoretical calculations, you could have planets around double stars. Now, about half of all stars, 60%, I think is an actual better number, are multiple stars. Stars, you know, like to have buddies, and they have. Many of them do. Okay. And you can have planets around these buddies if either they're very close together, so the planets come around both at once, or they're separated by not very much, maybe the distance from, from where you are to Saturn, which isn't a whole lot. And you could have planets around both of those things. Okay. In fact, we found planets around double stars. That, that has happened. Okay, but, well, if you can imagine some society growing up in a system like this, and maybe you grew up on a planet around this lower star, uh, you would, as soon as you invented rockets and radio, all of which are sort of contemporaneous, right? You invent radio, and then within 50 years you invent rockets, and then you invent the H-bomb. All these things happen at the same point. Right? So just when you go on the air, you blow yourself up. But, okay, so that's a different story. Uh, so you're on a planet around this guy, and, and very quickly you colonize some of the planets, assuming there are any, or just build satellites around that star, because a second star could be useful for you. Get some energy out of that. Who knows? Just study it. Right? And that means now you've, in, in some sense, your society extends over both stars, and they will communicate. Right? There will be communication back and forth between these two star systems. Now, imagine the situation, and this obtains for one in a couple of hundred of such stellar pairs, that they're seen kind of edged on. And they become what are called eclipsing binaries. You can see the, the uh, animation of an eclipsing binary over there. And here are actual observations of an eclipsing binary where you see the star you know, get brighter and dimmer because you know, the, the, the big star, which is kind of dim, gets in front of the small star, which was kind of bright. A small star is a white dwarf in this case. It doesn't matter. And anyway, you can see the light curve here. Okay, so these are called eclipsing binaries. You don't actually see the stars going around one another, but you know when one gets in front of the other because suddenly the light goes away. Okay, well, all you have to do is say when that happens, you're looking right down the communication pipeline between these double star systems. So again, this tells you when to look and where to look. It hasn't been done, but you know I think it's maybe something worth worth considering. Here's another idea, and this has also been uh, proposed. There was a big fight about whether we thought of it first or some guys at NASA had thought of it first, and then it turns out that the Russians had proposed it 20 years earlier. But <laughs> the problem is that nobody reads the Russian literature, I suppose, except the Russians. But this is a, a, a piece of art by Lynette Cook here in the Bay Area showing a planet transiting a star. We know about many of these now. But imagine for a moment that this is the Earth going in front of the sun. So, you know, this is what Kepler's looking for, of course, transiting planets. But imagine that the aliens had their own Kepler project years ago, and, and they found the Earth that way. Right? They just happened to be in the right parts of the, of the universe that they would see the Earth cross in front of the sun, so they know that there's Earth there. And, and you know, maybe they say, well, it's kind of a rocky world, and uh, uh, we can measure a little bit of oxygen in the atmosphere, so it maybe has some life. Why don't we occasionally give them a ping and see if they'll join our club? Okay, so... Maybe what they'll do is they'll say, look, we have to figure out when to broadcast to them. We don't know that there's any intelligent life there, but we'll broadcast to them sometime during the transit, which takes a couple of hours in the entire year. The Earth takes a year to go around the sun, and for a couple of hours, it'll block the sun from their point of view. Okay? So all we have to do then to get in touch with the aliens is examine the ecliptic. We just look at the path of the sun through the sky. We move the antenna one degree every day. Right, so there goes the sun around the ecliptic. We're looking in the anti-sun direction, of course, right? and, and expect their signal to come in, you know, wherever they are. When, when we're transiting the sun, they will time their signal to get to us when we transit the sun as seen from their star. Now, that requires that they know the distance from where they are to the sun fairly accurately, 
but not in an you know, unconscionable accuracy. It's the kind of accuracy we might have in 100 years. So, again, tells you where to look. They know uh, when and where to, to transmit. You can't read this. If they target the sun, by the way, if they're good enough, if they have big enough arrays that they can do that, it doesn't cost much in the way of power. Here are the alien transmitters over there. And their, their beam, whether it's a light beam or a radio beam, just covers the sun. They know we're somewhere in that disk. Then, you know, they can send us 100 bits per second with only the power of an automobile headlamp. Okay, so that's, that's pretty cheap. Okay. Um, we don't do this either, but it seems like an easy thing to do because all you need is an antenna about 25 meters across, you know, an 85-foot antenna, something like that, and you just look at the anti-sun direction all year long. Trivial. There are plenty of 25-meter antennas around. Okay, uh, you could look in the infrared. We don't do this either, but that, this is a, a, a matter of economics. And the reason to look in the infrared, I pointed out Shelley right here looking for flashing lights from the sky. But those photomultiplier tubes that are doing this, they're just sensitive to the kind of light that your eyeball is sensitive to, ordinary light, the light, the few photons in this room here. Okay, But ordinary light, it, it's great for a lot of things, but it's not maybe so good for signaling over long distances in the galaxy. This is a picture of the Milky Way at night here and a little bit of uh, earthly topography. But you see all these dark clouds. There's all this dust in the Milky Way, in the plane of the Milky Way. And what this does is it makes it uh, very hard to signal over distances greater than uh, on the order of a 1,000 light years. Depends on where you are and wh which direction. But on that order, if you're trying to signal farther than that with ordinary light, it isn't going to get through. It's going to get blocked by all that dust. Okay? So, but not in the infrared. Infrared goes right through the dust. Okay? So, doggone it. All we need to do is have a SETI, optical SETI experiment in the infrared, and let's look for things. And the problem with that is the infrared doesn't pe penetrate the atmosphere. So in order to do this, you have to move the experiment into space or maybe the backside of the moon or wherever. And that, that, uh, that's too expensive at the moment. But it's a very obvious thing to do. Okay, here's another idea. SETI is, you know, SETI experiments, we're looking for a signal in space, but we only look at one little tiny patch at a time. It's kind of you know, like uh, looking for, well, like for looking for comets. Now, you don't use the world's biggest telescopes to look for comets because they're looking at a little tiny patch of the, the Keck telescope will never find a, a comet. Comets are found by amateurs, mostly in Japan, it seems, with binoculars. And they get up very early every morning and they know where to look. Okay. Uh, because you need to scan a big part of the sky. Well, maybe there are all sorts of big signals coming from ET, you know, just a ping once every year in that direction, big blast of radio waves, and we never see it because we're not looking in the right spot at the right time. I mean, that could be. If they just once a year made a big ping in any spot on the sky, you would say, I don't know what it is, Bob, but there's something very weird in that direction. And you would spend whatever money you had to examine that spot on the sky. And then you might find a very low-powered uh, transmitter that was you know, giving you their version of uh, their encyclopedias or their internet or whatever it is. Okay. But we, we have no way of finding something that's going off, you know, intermittently in some part of the sky because we don't cover enough of the sky at once. Well, here's one way you could do that. You could use the moon as a garden ball. You know those silver garden balls you put in the, put them on? I don't know how many of you have those anymore. Maybe you have the storks in the front yard. Probably don't have those either. Okay. But it's one of these garden balls, these silver garden balls. And the deal is if you look at this thing, you see the whole sky, right? And you see your neighbor's house and all that. So you see everything. It's a really, really fishy fisheye lens. Okay, well, the moon works that way with radio waves, so the radio waves come in from at least half the universe. They bounce off this thing. And, of course, unfortunately, they get scattered in all directions. But some of them get scattered back toward your telescope. So by looking at the moon, you're looking at at least half the universe. Okay, now, because of these geometric effects, of course, your sensitivity is down by a small factor of 50,000, 100,000. But, you know, what are, what are five orders of magnitude when you're talking about aliens? Because if it was a really honking signal, one that, you know, would just about fry your toast, then this would work. And again, the size antenna you need for this is, a, a, again, on the order of 25 meters, at least at the kind of frequencies that SETI usually uses. So you could just cover the whole moon with this thing and, and just follow the moon. In fact, you want two of them, right? The moon tends to set. So you have one on one side of the earth, the other on the other side of the earth, and you just, just look at it all the time. Look at it all the time. Just in case. Just in case. Okay, here's another scheme. This is a spectrum of the earth, as seen from space. Now, you notice a couple of things in the spectrum. This is just a distribution of the light. This is kind of a rainbow of the Earth. And you see it has oxygen, better known as ozone here, carbon dioxide, things like that. 